Now, in Romans chapter 1, I'm, I'm not really preaching on Romans chapter 1. I just wanted to pull out a couple of phrases here just as an introduction to my sermon. The first phrase that I want to pull out as an introduction is in verse 13, where the Bible says, Now, I would not have you ignorant, brethren. And he goes on to say what he doesn't want them ignorant of. But you'll find the Apostle Paul making that statement five times throughout the New Testament. I don't want you to be ignorant. Now, what does it mean to be ignorant? It doesn't mean that you're stupid. It doesn't mean that you... Uh, are not able to learn. It doesn't mean that you have a learning disability. It means that no one has ever told you something. I mean, if someone were to tell you this, you'd understand it, you'd comprehend it, you'd learn it, but you're just ignorant of it. I mean, you're just unaware of it. No one has exposed you to it. Paul said, I would hate for anybody who came to my church or was under my ministry and heard my preaching to be ignorant. And he listed, you know, five different things in the New Testament where he said, these are things I don't want you to be ignorant about. He said, I want to expose you to the whole truth, all the counsel of God. So why am I preaching this sermon tonight? Because I don't want you to be ignorant. The other point that I want to make in chapter 1 here, just as an introduction, is in verse 30. In this list of uh, all the horrible attributes of wicked, reprobate, ungodly, unsalvageable, uh, abominable people that are in this world. And by the way, they're out there, and there are many of them. There's a list here that, that describes just how wicked and filthy and perverted some people are in this world. And he just kind of lists all their attributes. Some of the things he lists are worse than others, you know, some of the things that they do. Disobedient to parents, I mean, that's something that probably we've all been guilty of when we're growing up. But, uh, you know, lack of respect for authority. Some of the things on the list are very bad. Some of them are a little bit milder. But it's just a description, a snapshot of these wicked, uh, filthy reprobates. But look at that phrase in the middle of verse 30. And this is what I want to preach on tonight. This one phrase, inventors of evil things. That's the phrase that I want to preach on tonight. Inventors of evil things. And uh, the other title, my sermon has two titles tonight. Title number one, inventors of evil things. Title number two, planned barrenhood. Not planned parenthood, okay. Planned barrenhood, okay. And so uh, those are the two titles of my sermon tonight. Planned Barrenhood and Inventors of Evil Things. So you pick the title that you like the best, and you can put that on the CD when you burn it, which one you like better. And so uh, I'll leave that up to you, Amanda, all right? So uh, let's turn our Bible site to Psalm 106, and we'll see what are we talking about, Inventors of Evil Things. What is God talking about when he says there are people who invent evil things? Now, what does the word evil mean? The word evil does not mean sinful. The word evil does not mean that it's morally wrong. Did you know that God does evil? The Bible says that God created evil. The Bible says that is there an evil in the city and the Lord hath not done it? The Bible says that God repented of the evil that he thought to do unto the children of Israel. Evil is not something that's a sin or wrong. Evil is something that harms or hurts someone else. That's what evil means. If I do evil to someone, I'm harming them, I'm hurting them. Now most of the time that's sin. Now, if I were to take somebody who was a murderer and execute them according to the death penalty, as God says, I would be doing evil to that person, but am I committing sin? No, I'd be obeying the Bible. You know, if I were, if I were the executioner, if I were by law appointed to uh, execute someone, which I'm not, if I were, that would not be evil. If God punishes someone, if, if someone commits sin and God kills them and punishes them, he's doing evil to that person, but he's committing sin. No, God can't sin. God cannot uh, deny himself. He cannot break his word. He cannot lie. He cannot do wrong. His holiness prevents him from ever doing anything wrong. And so do you understand the difference between evil and sin? Evil is something that harms someone else. If I went to the battlefield to defend my country against foreign invaders and I shot someone, okay, I'm harming them. I'm hurting them. But am I committing sin? No. If somebody broke into my house tonight and uh, was going to attack my family and I pulled out my 45 and shot them, am I... Doing evil to that person? Am I harming them? Yes. But is it a sin? No. It's the right thing to do to protect my family or the Bible. Does everybody understand how there's the evil and sin? And so don't let that bother you when you read the Bible and you get confused. Like God's doing evil? God can't sin, but God does hurt other people sometimes when, when he needs to do that. Okay? So when we're talking about inventors of evil things, we're talking about people who invent something that will harm or kill another human being, okay? We're talking about people who invent something that uh, maliciously would destroy a human being. Now, look at Psalm 106, and we'll see a little bit more about these inventions, you know? I like to study words in the Bible. 
I like to get out my concordance. If you don't have a concordance, you should get one or get a software. I like to look up words and see every time they're used in the Bible. So you can look up words like inventor, inventions. And if you look at all the different mentions, you'll get an idea of, of uh, what God's talking about. But look at Psalm 106. And uh, the book of Psalms right in the center of your Bible. You let it fall open right in the middle. Psalm 106. And let's begin reading in verse number... Well, let's start reading in verse number 34. The Bible reads, They did not, speaking of the children of Israel, destroy the nations concerning whom the Lord commanded them, but were mingled among the heathen and learned their works. So they began to be mixed in with unbelievers and pagans and, and people who were idolaters and people who were uh, wicked and sinful, and they began to learn their works. And uh, they started to rub off on them. They started to act like them. They started to live like them. It says that they learned their works. And then the next step in verse 36 says they served their idols. Next thing you know, they're worshiping their gods. And then after that, it says, which were a snare unto them. Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils. Wow, isn't that a big jump here? First, they're just mingled among the heathen. Hanging around with the worldly, unbelieving crowd. Hanging around with a bunch of ungodly, wicked people. And you know, there are wicked people all over this city. There's wicked people on the job. There's wicked people at school. There's people that you shouldn't have anything to do with, that you shouldn't be around. Uh, kids especially listen to me right now. Hey, you don't want to be around them. They're everywhere. And what happens when you become mingled with the ungodly, heathen, wicked crowd? You learn their works. You begin to serve their idols. They, you begin to serve money and, and, uh, and, and pleasure and hedonism and if it feels good, do it. And all the, the, the movies and the, and the rock and roll lifestyle, you begin to serve their gods. You begin to learn their works. And then a person can come to the point, and even a Christian, even God's people, can get to the point where in verse 37 it says they sacrifice their sons and daughters unto the devils. Now you say, Pastor Anderson... I don't believe that a Christian would ever murder their own child. You're wrong. If you don't believe that, then you're wrong. Because the Bible says that they did. And let's keep reading. It says, yeah, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils. Look at verse 38. And I'm going to prove you wrong. It says, and shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and of their daughters, whom they sacrificed unto the idols of Canaan. And the land was polluted with blood, they were defiled with their own works and went a whoring with their own inventions. Do you see that? They went a whoring with their own inventions. So there was some invention that they used in the process of going a whoring. Do you see that? Did I make that up? Or I, I think that's what the Bible says. Let me go back and read it again just to make sure I'm not making something up here. It says they were defiled with their own works and went a whoring with their own inventions. Therefore was the wrath of the Lord kindled against his people, insomuch that he abhorred his own inheritance, and he gave them into the hand of the heathen, and they that hated them ruled over them. Their enemies also oppressed them, and they were brought into subjection under their hand. Many times they delivered them, but they provoked him with their counsel, and were brought low for their iniquity. Now we see here people who went out and, and they, they got to hang around with the world. They started learning worldly philosophies, worldly religion, worldly principles. And they got to the point where they were murdering their own children. And where they were whoring with wicked, evil inventions. Like we read about in Romans chapter 1. Now what am I talking about? Well, what I'm talking about is, is the wicked inventions of the institution and, and others that have gone on before it. You see, there's nothing new under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new. It had been already of old time, which was before us. That's what it says in Ecclesiastes 1. There's nothing new. The world has had all the same things. Everybody thinks that they came out with something new, but it's already been around, the Bible says. The sun goes up, the sun goes down. This world's been around for thousands of years, 6,000 approximately and the same things have been going on from the time it was created until now. There's nothing new. It's just in a different package. It just looks different. It just uh, feels different, but it's, it's the same things. You see, people have been using inventions for years to murder their children. They've been doing it for years. You say, I don't know what I'm talking about. You're going to know what I'm talking about by the time I'm done. And uh, many of you do know what I'm talking about. But there's an organization, Planned Parenthood. 
And you say, well, I thought it was called Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood is all about not having children and killing your children. So I've decided to call it Planned Parenthood, not Planned Parenthood. Because it's not about being a parent. It's not about having children. It's about killing your children. Right. Okay? That's what it's all about. And so let's just explain a little bit about it. Now, you might know the name of Planned Parenthood. See, Planned Parenthood is kind of a name that doesn't really fit their agenda, does it? But did you know it wasn't always called Planned Parenthood? It used to have a much more honest name. Okay? Now, now it's called Planned Parenthood to fool you into it sounding like it's something innocent. But you know what it used to be called? It used to be called the Birth Control Federation of America. That's what it used to be called. And then they changed the name to Planned Parenthood. But it, earlier in the century, it used to be called the Birth Control Federation of America. It was started by a woman by the name of Margaret Sanger. Okay. Margaret Sanger was a, a wicked person. She was a person who was a racist. She hated people of other races. She hated the handicapped. Okay. She hated people who were black. She hated people who were, who were minorities. She hated people who were not smart. She hated people who had physical problems. And so she wanted to rid the world of them. And so she, she said, we must do everything we can to stop minorities from breeding. That's what she said. She said, we've got to stop these minorities from breeding and taking over. I mean, all these dumb people and all these people who are black and all this. We've got to stop them from breeding. And so we've got to get them on birth control. And so she began to set up these birth control centers all over poor areas and all over areas that were filled with blacks and minorities. Okay, to try to to try to uh, eliminate their population. And by the way, they're still doing it today. Mm -hmm. They're 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 still trying to stop black people and minorities from from uh, having children. They get they get them to do abortions on the government's dime. They've got them on birth control because they want to eliminate the poor. They want to eliminate. Hey, Jesus said the poor you have with you always. There's always going to be people who are poor. There are always going to be people that are handicapped. There's always going to be people that have problems. And we've got to love those people and not say, let's get rid of them. Now, and by the way, where in the Bible does it, does it talk about races of people and that one race is better than another? The Bible says that God's made all nations of the earth of one blood. Okay? And so this teaching that uh, black people or brown people are somehow inferior to white people is a lie of the pit of hell. And Margaret Sanger uh, was, was indoctrinated with this. She was a believer in what's known as eugenics. Just like Adolf Hitler. Wanted to create a master race. Wanted to create a race of superhuman, perfect humans. And that's exactly what Adolf Hitler was doing. Margaret Sanger believed the same thing. Now, let me read for you. And, and, and I want to show you... And this will just graphically illustrate to you how far we've come as a nation and how far our Baptist churches have come in just the 20th century's time, in just less than 100 years. Let me give you a little history throughout the uh, 20th century, the previous century. Listen to this. In 1916, so that was how long ago? 92 years ago. 92? Well, actually, let's back up to 1905, shall we? 1905, 103 years ago. Now, if we were to back up 200 years, the average family in the United States, the average, so some had much more, some had much less, the average woman in America had eight children in her lifetime in the year 1800. Now, the, around the year 1900, that had dropped to four children, was the average. In 1905, the President of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt, stood up. I mean, we're talking about the President of the United States, not a preacher, not a Baptist, just the President of the United States, stood up in a, in, a, in a speech in March of 1905 and attacked birth control and condemned the tendency toward smaller families as decadent and a sign of moral disease, he said. And he said, birth control is sinful. He said, you are a criminal to society if you practice birth control. He said to a group of women in March of 1905 and said that it's a moral disease to purposely have a small family. That's what he said. He said birth control is a sin. That's the president of the United States. Can you imagine George W. Bush getting on the getting on TV tonight and just saying, look, I know this isn't popular, but birth control is sin. And it's a moral disease. And you are a criminal to the United States of America, ladies, if you practice birth control. Can you imagine George W. Bush saying that? Come a long way, baby. And that was only 103 years ago. Okay? And now now I'm now you want to put me in a straight jacket for saying it. 103 years later, I'm a Baptist preacher. I'm behind the pulpit. 
But listen to this. In 1916, 11 years later, you see, he already saw the tendency, Theodore Roosevelt did. He saw what was going on, how the, the, the family size was dropping. And so he made that speech as President of the United States to try to stop that trend. But in 1916, Margaret Sanger tested the validity of New York's anti-contraception law by establishing a clinic in Brooklyn. So she set up one of these, you know, uh, Planned Parenthood clinics in New York. Just to see, because it was against the law, but she just wanted to see if she was really going to get arrested. You know, you know, there's some laws on the books, but they don't really get enforced. So she said, well, let's test it out. So in 1916, she set up a clinic in Brooklyn, a birth control clinic. And uh, she, was, she was arrested for setting up this clinic. And her clinic was shut down. She was arrested in 1916 when she set up this clinic to uh, just talk to people about birth control and explain it about birth control. In 1918, she won a lawsuit that went all the way to the Supreme Court. And this lawsuit allowed doctors to advise only married patients about birth control for health purposes, like if there was a problem with their health, or if there was a reason why they shouldn't have children, they were allowed to, oh, no devices, no inventions, they were only allowed to talk about it and discuss it with their patients, was the law in 1918. They, they could talk about it, because Margaret Sanger pushed this thing to where they could at least just talk to them about it if it was a health issue. Eighteen years later, in 1936, she won a lawsuit, and this lawsuit went on for, I think, 18 or 19 years. I mean, she fought this thing. She imported a box of, and I'm just going to spell this for the sake of C O N D O M S, okay? She imported a box from, a, from some wicked country in Asia, okay? Mm. She imported a box of these things. And uh, the box sat unopened, you know, confiscated by the U.S. government for 18 years while this battle ensued. While the battle went on. And in 1936, she won the battle and they opened the box and began to sell what I spelled out to you a little bit earlier in 1936. And it was allowed to be given out by doctors. Now, in the meantime, between 1918 and 1936, Margaret Sanger was writing books telling women how they could give themselves an abortion without the help of anyone. Drugs that they could take. Uh, different teas that they could drink, herbs that they could take that would kill their own child. Uh, other ways to mechanically abort their own child that were very dangerous, and many women died trying to give themselves an abortion using Margaret Sanger's wicked methods from her books. And I've seen the books, I've read excerpts from her books about it, describing how to do it. But in 1936, she wins this great victory that allows those uh, devices that I mentioned. And by the way, I wonder who invented those. I think it was some Baptist somewhere, some godly Christian, and it was some wicked, filthy pervert, like the people described in Romans chapter 1, inventors of evil things. They invented some uh, device that's going to stop women from getting pregnant. But, but let's keep going here. It gets worse. Because we haven't gotten to any murder yet, except for her book, which she's right, she's telling women how to uh, abort their children. But in 1965, the Supreme Court overturned one of the last state laws, because that was just in New York that she won that battle. One of the last state laws in 1965 prohibiting the prescription or use of contraceptives by married couples only. In 1965, it became totally legal. In 1969, California adopted the nation's first no-fault divorce law, allowing divorce by mutual consent. So until 1969, nowhere in America could you get a divorce just by saying, we don't, we don't like each other anymore. We're not compatible. You know, and people get divorced like that all the time, right? To say I'm getting divorced. It used to be that you could only get divorced if it was adultery. Or if there was some kind of abuse going on or something. Just even by law. Because it was a mutually, it was a law binding contract. I mean, you're, you're swearing before God and you're swearing before the government saying, till death us depart. And that was like, just like when you buy a house. I mean, you sign on the dot line. You can't just walk away from that loan. I just don't feel like my mortgage and I are compatible. I'm not saying it's the, I'm not saying it's the lender's fault or it's, I don't know it's not my fault it's not the lender's fault I just feel like this loan and I are just not really clicking you know I mean for the first few years maybe the payment was good and everything now I just don't feel like we're compatible so I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, no fault divorce my loan no when you when you sign a legal document 
You're, you know, you're making a commitment here. You're saying, I'm going to pay this payment for the next 30 years. I mean, I'm stuck with this house. You know, if it falls apart on me or whatever, hey, it's still 30 years from now until it's do part. Or, or pay for it or sell it or something. But you can't just walk away from it. Okay? And that's the way it used to be. And, and that's a foreign concept to us because we live in 2008. Back then, that was the law of the land. Until 1969, and only California, you would have to go to California to get a divorce. You'd have to go there and get this no-fault divorce. Or nobody's at fault, we just decided we wanted to end it. Then in 1972, three years later, in Eisenstadt versus Baird, the Supreme Court ruled that the right to privacy encompasses an unmarried person's right to use contraceptives. Okay? So an unmarried person is allowed to use contraceptives in 1972 because of what? The right to privacy. Now, I don't remember reading about the right to privacy in the Bill of Rights or the Constitution. I mean, I know there's the right to be secure in your person and your property, but I read about that in the, in the Fourth Amendment. But I didn't know there was a right to privacy where if I want to just, uh, you know, go out and, and uh, kill somebody or do something perverted or something weird, uh, that's my private don't mess with, don't get involved in my life. That's not what the Bill of Rights is talking about. But it says in, uh, then in 1973, just one year later, they said, well, if the right to privacy encompasses an unmarried person's right to use contraceptives, then Roe versus Wade, 1973, where the U.S. Supreme Court declared that the Constitution protects women's right to terminate an early pregnancy, thus making abortion legal in the U.S. in 1973. So in 1973, the Supreme Court says, well, because of privacy, you're allowed to kill your child while it's in the womb. Because of privacy. Now, I guess you can just shut the door to your house and just hurt people and just do whatever you want, right? Because of privacy. Then in 19... Uh, let's see here. I think that... In 1981, Kirchhoff, Kurtzberg versus Feenstra, uh, the Supreme Court overturned state laws that a husband is the boss of his house and that he's the one who can make financial decisions and so forth. They took that power away from men in 1981 legally. And uh, on and on, there's these different lists here. I'm not going to go through all of these. But you see the progression in America. You know, it, it's, it, do you see how it's been kind of recently that this stuff has been allowed? I mean, in the scheme of things? And this is what John R. Rice, who's ever heard of John R. Rice? He's a, a famous Baptist preacher of yesteryear. And, uh, very extremely well-known preacher, Baptist preacher, and uh, this is what he said in 1946. He said, the use of artificial means, drugs, and appliances to prevent conception has for centuries been regarded as immoral, wrong for the individual, and dangerous to society as a whole. Then he said this, birth control measures if generally practiced would be disastrous to public morals and public welfare. Now look at our morals. Look where we're at today and tell me, was John R. Rice right or wrong when he said that? We see where we're at today. We're in a society where just anything goes. There's no limit to what people can do. There's no limit to what young people and adults are allowed to do. Uh, why? Because it all started with this birth control Federation of America, which became Planned Parenthood which has corrupted our society and did evil things. Now you say, well, what are the evil things? So you haven't really got to the, the evil, uh, murderous things. Well, the, the first one that I want to talk about is one that goes all the way back to the Bible days, and even before the Bible days. In fact, archaeologists have discovered evidence over 3,000 years old in ancient Egypt. So we're talking about over 1,000 years before Jesus Christ walked on this earth of what's known as the IUD. Who's ever heard of an IUD? Interuterine device. Kind of like one of those inventions, these devices, appliances. Well, the IUD was invented, as far as we know, in ancient Egypt over 3,000 years ago. Nothing new under the sun, is there? And what this IUD does, this evil thing, this wicked, abominable, murderous device, is it's something that's implanted inside of a woman's uterus. And this device is implanted inside the woman's uterus so that when she fertilizes an egg, and let, let me just give you a little biology lesson, okay? And I'm not going to be graphic or anything, you don't have to worry about that. But let me just give you a biology lesson. A woman has uh, eggs that she releases every single month, one egg per month, okay? And these eggs travel down what's called the fallopian tubes. And when they come down to the bottom of the fallopian tubes, they get to the uterus. Now, 
if that egg is fertilized, if, if a woman's unmarried, you know, not and not committing fornication, then that egg will just pass through her system every month and it will not become alive. But when she's married or fornicating, whatever the case may be, hopefully married and, and doing what's right, then what happens is the seed from a man will fertilize that egg while it's coming down the fallopian tube. Okay? Now it takes 7 to 14 days for the egg to make that journey down the fallopian tube, and then when it gets to the uterus, it implants in the wall of the uterus. Okay? Now the moment that it's fertilized by the seed, it begins to multiply. It starts out just one cell. Okay? Everybody following this? One cell. As soon as it's fertilized, it splits into two cells, four cells, eight cells, 16 cells, 32 cells, into just millions and millions of cells. It begins to multiply. And it begins to grow and take the shape of a, of a, of a baby. You'll see like a kidney bean shape. And then pretty soon the head appears, and pretty soon uh, little stubs appear that become the hands and the fingers and the feet, and all the different organs develop. And after nine months, one will give birth to a fully developed uh, newborn baby. Now, as the, as the uh, developing embryo, the fertilized egg, the embryo that's multiplying, begins to travel down that tube. When it gets to the uterus, it has to implant in the wall of the uterus in order to survive. Okay. It implants in the wall of the uterus, and it begins to grow and grow and grow. Pretty soon it has an umbilical cord and a placenta, and it will stay attached to the wall of the uterus in those early days, okay? And then eventually it'll come loose from the uterus, and the placenta is attached to the uterus, okay? It'll separate from the placenta. It'll be connected to the placenta with the umbilical cord, where it's getting all its nutrients and being fed from the mother. Until it's born, the woman will give birth to the baby and then give birth to the placenta afterward, and they cut the cord and you live happily ever after. So that's that's how it works. Now, this is what an IUD does. You say, why are you preaching this? Because I don't want you to be ignorant. I just heard about people last week in an independent fundamental Baptist church who had ladies coming to them and saying, I am getting an IUD. And they did not understand, they didn't know. I mean, it's not that they were trying to go out and kill their own children. They had no idea that there was anything wrong with an IUD. They didn't even know what it does. They just believe some lying, evil doctor who tells them, get an IUD, use this IUD. Or some Bible college that, that tells them to use all this birth control and all these pills and devices. And so this IUD is a, is a device that goes inside of the woman's uterus so that it creates a hostile environment in the uterus. And it hardens the lining of the uterus so that developed fertilized uh, little embryo, that blastocyst as it's called, that tiny little microscopic baby, as it comes down and tries to implant in the uterus, it finds a hardened wall lining and it cannot implant and therefore dies because it can't implant and survive. It can't get the nutrients from its mother by implanting and developing that placenta and so it dies. And most women don't really even know that they were ever pregnant. They don't really know that it died, because it died when it was only a week or two old, and so they have no clue. It's just as if it were never fertilized in their mind, they don't really know. And so that's what an IUD does, it's a device that causes it. Now, I, I talked to somebody recently that said that on TV, and I haven't watched TV in years, I have no clue about this, but they said that on TV, they're constantly hitting you with these commercials for IUDs, and for these devices. I don't know if anybody knows what I'm talking about, hopefully you, you've decided not to watch all the garbage that's on TV, but but somebody just told me last week, they said just on TV, it's just one after another, just boom. And Myrena, they, they give these cute little names, you know. Get Myrena, some little ring or something that, that goes up in your uterus and stops you from getting pregnant, right? No, actually it kills your child when it's a week or two old. It's what an IUD does. And so these IUDs are wicked. They came out of ancient Egypt, they've been used for thousands of years, and they will murder your child. Now you say, wait a minute, I don't believe that. I don't believe that it's murder. Because come on, Pastor Anderson, is it really a baby when it's only a week old? I mean, when it's just a little dot of a thing? I mean, when it's just a tiny little thing? I mean, is it really alive? Well, let's see what the Bible says. Let's see if the Bible says it's alive. Well, turn in your Bible to, let's see if it's just a blob of tissue, or if it's really alive. Well, look at, look at Hosea 9-11. Hosea 9-11. And let, let's see if, if it's really alive. Because you say, well, it's not murder because it's not alive. And while you're turning there, I'll, I'll read you this quote from the president of, of Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood. 
uh, president, says this. Pregnancy begins with the implantation of the developing fertilized egg in a woman's uterus. And she says this implantation doesn't occur until seven days after fertilization. Okay? So the, the president, uh, her name is Vanessa Collins, the vice president for medical affairs at Planned Parenthood Federation of America. And by the way, next time you see one of these Planned Parenthood buildings, just spit on it or curse it out out the window or whatever you want to do, but, but they're wicked. And, and so the thing is, she says, well, no, pregnancy does not begin at fertilization. Pregnancy does not begin at conception when the seed and the egg come together. She says, no, pregnancy begins with implantation. She just decided that that's when it begins. That way she can say it's not murder to use an IUD or to end the pregnancy in the first seven days or from 14, depending on the woman. Well, let's see if she's right. The Bible says in Hosea 9-11, As for Ephraim, their glory shall fly away like a bird. From the birth and from the womb and from the conception, though they bring up their children, yet will I bereave them. Now here we see three stages in the development of what? What is it called in verse 12? Children. You see that? Where they bring up children. So children start out at conception. Then they're in the womb. And then there's the birth. Okay? So God calls it a child. Now, in Isaiah 7.14, I'll, I'll just briefly say this because I've said it so many times. In Isaiah 7.14, the Bible says, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted as God with us. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, it says, uh, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted as God with us. So in Isaiah 7.14, it says, Conceive. In Matthew 1, it makes the exact same quotation and says, be with child. Because conceiving is being with child. Right. Not, behold, a woman shall be with blah and shall bring forth a son. Behold, a woman shall have a blastocyst that will later become a child and call his name Jesus. Wrong. Job said this. He said, thou hast fashioned me round in my mother's womb. How do you know that he's round? Do you have a microscope? But babies, guess how they begin? Round. It's perfectly a circle. In their first seven days, that's what they look like. They're round. And then eventually that round shape, as God said in the book of Job, which is the oldest book in the Bible, the first book in the Bible ever to be written is the book of Job. And it says that it was round. And then that round becomes a kidney bean shape. And eventually you see the head and the body develop and on and on. And so here we don't see... Just a blah, we see a child. Look at Ecclesiastes 11.5. Ecclesiastes, Psalm, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Because the question is, if life doesn't begin at conception, which is fertilization, which is the seed and the egg coming together, when does it begin? Does it begin, as Vanessa says, at implantation? Does the life begin when it's born? That, that's what, that's what our, our Democratic Party in the United States believes. The Democratic political party in the United States believes that life begins at birth. Because they, they want to abort babies. Hey, you know our stinking liberal, lesbian, dyke governor, Janet Lepalpa, send her the tape, tell her to put it in her stinking pipe and smoke it. Tell her to stay away from me too if she wants to be safe. Uh, Tell us thinking J Janet Napolitano, the murdering pervert witch governor of our of our state. Why don't you tell her that life begins at conception, not at birth, because she vetoed twice. She vetoed twice legislation that would ban partial birth abortion in Arizona in the last two months. Did you hear that? In the last two months, the legislature of the state of Arizona said, can we at least Put a stop to killing babies while they're being born? Partial birth abortion where they're partly born and they kill them right there on the operating table in cold blood? Can we at least put a stop to that? She said, no. What a monster. And you know what? I don't care whether you like this or not. J Janet Napolitano needs to be taken out like a dog and shot. Did you hear me? Let me say it again. Janet Napolitano needs to be taken out like a dog and shot. She's a monster and a pervert. 
And if we have any justice in this country, murder, and I'm not saying I'm going to do it, I'm not saying you should do it, I'm saying that the police should go down if they were worth anything, they'd go down and they'd haul off Janet Napolitano and they'd take her out like a dog and shoot her like the dog animal that she is. Take her out and kill her because she's a murderer. And murderers, according to the Bible, should be killed. Did you know that in the 1950s, my dad knew a guy, he was an acquaintance, and this guy came to his house one time. And this guy came, I was just talking to my daddy, he brought this up to me yesterday. This guy came over to their house, and my grandma said, I don't want that guy to ever come to our house again, that guy's weird. I think that guy's a little bit weird, okay? You're listening, this is in the 1950s. Well, that same guy, he was driving through Topanga Canyon in California, and he saw a woman broken down by the side of the road. He pulled over, he locked her in the car and forced her to do immorality with him, got in the car and drove off. Okay? That man was put to the gas chamber in the 1950s in California. Did you hear that? That's the way this country used to have justice. I mean, he didn't kill anybody, but he committed rape. And guess what? He went to the gas chamber in 1955 or 56 or whatever it was. Did you hear that? In the state of California, in the United States of America. That's the way justice used to be in this country. And you know what? Napolitano needs to go to the gas chamber. Yes, she does. Face it, friend. Janet Napolitano, I'm just keep saying it until you get this. Janet Napolitano needs to go to the gas chamber. And guess what? Bill Clinton, while he was president of the United States, twice vetoed a ban on partial birth abortion nationwide. Guess where he needs to go? Yep. To the gas chamber. Okay. Like it or lump it, my friend. And you know what? If, if Janet Napolitano comes near me, I'll spit in her face and tell her she's a freak of nature. And tell her, to, tell her to go get AIDS and die, the lesbian that she is. And you can like that or not like it. You can be, oh, I don't know if you're allowed to say that. Hey, you know what? I don't know if people are allowed to kill human beings. I don't think God allows that either. I'm a preacher. I'll say whatever I want. So are you mad about this? And if, if you're not mad, maybe you need to, maybe you need to check yourself. Maybe you need to check your heart if that doesn't make you mad. Because I am mad about it. And so, this is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with people who are Democrats, and, and even now Republicans. Uh, a lot of female Republican candidates that are running for office are, are for abortion. They're pro-choice. Uh, of course, it's not a choice, it's a child. But uh, these, these pro-choice Republicans and Democrats and, and uh, both parties are, are, are going down the toilets as far as I'm concerned. And uh, now they're saying life begins at birth. Now is that the truth? No. Because Jeremiah was called by God to, to preach the gospel in his mother's womb. John the Baptist leaped in his mother's womb when his mother got near her cousin Elizabeth, okay, I mean her cousin Mary, Jesus was in Mary's womb. John the Baptist was in Elizabeth's womb. They were three months apart in age. And the child leaped in the womb when he heard Mary's voice. Wow. It's a lie. It's a human being. But you say, well, okay, Pastor Anderson, there's no way that life begins at birth. Come on. But I'm just not really sure that life begins at conception either. I think it's probably somewhere in between. You know, the moderates of our day. I don't want to do anything in moderation. I don't want to be a moderate. You know what a moderate is? They're just trying to see what's popular. They just go whichever way the wind blows. I'm not a moderate anything. But the moderates say, well, come on, don't be extreme. It's somewhere in between. Well, let's see what God says about that opinion. Look at Ecclesiastes 11.5. The Bible reads in Ecclesiastes 11.5. I'm sorry, it's kind of preaching bug you. I, I hate to do that to you. Uh, Ecclesiastes 11.5, the Bible says, As thou knowest not what is the way of the Spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. Do you know what God is doing in the womb when he's <coughs> developing a child? You say, oh, I, I read all about it in the book I studied in college. Do you really know what God's doing when he makes that child in the womb? No. You don't know what God's doing when He causes the bones to grow in the womb of her that is a child. You don't know what He's doing. Don't pretend to know when life begins in the womb. Don't pick some arbitrary point like implantation or at the six week mark or at the first trimester or at the second trimester. God says, You don't know what I'm doing when I create children in the womb. 
Uh, Psalm 139. Turn there quickly. Psalm 139. Here in Ecclesiastes, just go back to two books. Oh, I think that's so extreme for you to say that the Napolitano should be killed. You know what? Would you think it was extreme if she actually were killed? I'm just talking about it. It should actually be done by our government. Are you listening to me? You think it's extreme for me to say it. I think it's extreme not to do it. Are you listening to me? And again, I'm not advocating anarchy. I'm not saying that I'm going to do it or you should do it. Of course not. We abide by the laws of our land. But you know what? The government, if they were actually enforcing our laws against murder, would take her out and she'd be what's called an accomplice to murder. She'd be aiding and abetting murder by putting people in a position where they can commit the crime of murder. She's helping them and furthering it. And by the way, she needs to grow out of hair and have long hair like a, woman, like a woman's supposed to have according to the Bible. Maybe then she won't look like a lesbian anymore. But in Psalm 139, the Bible says, My substance was not hid from thee. Verse 15, I'm sorry. When I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. Now, what does the word perfect mean in the Bible? Keep your finger there. You don't have to turn there, but I'm, I'm going to turn to James chapter 1 and just help you see what the word perfect means. Because sometimes we think perfect means like it has no mistake or no sin. And, you know, that's not really what it means. The word perfect throughout the Bible, if you, if you look up every time the word perfect is used, you'll see that this definition is pretty consistent. But it says in verse number 4 of James 1, it says, But let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So perfection, according to the Bible, is when you are entire. What does the word entire mean? Complete. Okay? And he says wanting nothing, which means you don't lack anything. So as far as a, a human being specimen here, I'm perfect. Okay? Now, do I have any flaws about me here? Okay? In, in my body? Look at this face. Is there a flaw here? Okay. You know, obviously I have flaws. You know? Okay? But I'm complete. I mean, I've got five fingers on this hand, five fingers on this hand, uh, five feet on each, or five, five toes on each foot. I don't, I don't know what's going on. Uh, five toes on each foot, I've got two arms, two legs. Okay, I'm complete here. I've got a couple of kidneys, I've got a heart, I've got a large intestine, small intestine, two lungs, a trachea, an esophagus, eyes, ears. i got everything. I'm complete. I'm entire. I'm not lacking anything like body parts. Are you listening? Now that's what he means here. Look, look at Psalm 139. He says, Thine eyes did me see my substance. So he's calling what he was a substance. And he says, Yet being unperfect. And in thy book, all my members were written. Now members are body parts in the Bible. Read, read 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Okay? Members, he's talking about yeah, have you ever heard of somebody being dismembered? Okay, so members are your body parts. And so he says here, uh, my members were written, which in continuance, that means over time, were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. So he's saying there was a point in his development in the womb, because he says it in his mother's womb, okay, in, uh, uh, where is it? It says, in, oh yeah, there we go, verse 13, he says he's in his mother's womb, okay, and his body parts are being fashioned. Some of them don't exist yet. Because in those real early stages of pregnancy, right, there's not necessarily five fingers, okay? It's just this little ball or a circle or kidney bean shape. But it's still David. It's still a human being, according to Psalm 139. And God is constantly, daily, hourly, every minute, every second, my wife's pregnant right now, God is fashioning a child in her womb right now. This moment, God is developing the, the, the fingers, the toes, the lungs, the heart. I mean, God is working on it right now, every second of every day. I mean, do you believe that or not? In continuance, he's fashioning. <laughs> he's making something. He's building that child in the womb right now. It's alive. It's a human being. David said, that was me. I was in my mother's womb. God was thinking about me. God was looking at me. God was creating me in the womb. How precious are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I wake, I am still with thee. 
Surely thou wouldst slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men. And so we see here that uh, throughout the Bible, God shows that children in the womb are alive. John the Baptist was able to recognize the voice of Mary in his mother's womb. The Bible says he was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. Jeremiah was called from the womb. David was in the womb. God said, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. I knew thee. Okay, it's Jeremiah in, in chapter 1, verse 5. And so on and on throughout the Bible, it's so silly. Remember, Esau and Jacob were fighting with one another in the womb. You remember that? They were battling in their mother's womb. And so, of course, it's a lie. It's, it's nonsense to think that a baby who's born at 37 weeks is alive, but a baby who's still in the womb at 39 weeks is not alive, even though it's more developed than the other. Think about this. There are babies that are born. Uh, my wife's going to tell you this. How early, and, and this happened while we were in Chicago, they took a baby out of its mother's womb at some insanely early age, and it stayed alive. How old was it? Do you remember approximately? 22 weeks. Like 22 weeks gestational. It weighed a half an ounce. It weighed a half an ounce, and it was taken out by C-section and survived and lived outside the womb at 22 weeks. Now, legally, that child was alive, and yet women can abort children at 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, all the way up to 39, 40 weeks. Does that really make any sense logically? That in one second, when it comes out of the womb, it becomes alive? Of course not. Have you ever looked at an ultrasound? Have you ever seen a baby smiling, uh, playing, doing all kinds of things inside this mother's womb? And so, come on, it's not birth. If we pick an arbitrary point throughout pregnancy, we're trying to usurp God's authority who says, you don't know what I'm doing, stay out of my business. The only place that it can be in, in is conception. And that's why God said conception equals with child. That's why in Hosea 9 11, conception is a child. Okay, it's pretty clear, isn't it? Well, dictionaries have started changing in only the last 20 years. This is how wicked this plan is. In the last 20 years, dictionaries have begun to change. And about half of the dictionaries out there now still say that conception is fertilization, it's the seed and the egg coming together. But half of your dictionaries now offer that definition and an alternate definition of implantation. Did you hear that? They'll offer in, in these dictionaries, they'll say, well, it's fertilization or it could mean implantation. When I was in Bible college, Dr. Dennis Streeter at Heil Sanderson came and taught that life began in implantation. He said, implantation is when pregnancy begins. Exactly what Planned Parenthood said. Dr. Dennis Streeter, did you get that? D-E-N-N-I-S-S-T-R-E-T-E-R -S -S -E -E said that, and I got on tape by the way, uh, he said, and I wasn't supposed to be taping it, but I did. And so I got on tape of him saying that it begins at implantation. He said that's when pregnancy begins. Because he's handing out birth control pills down in Howard Anderson College like they're king. He's giving them out to girls for free. Every engaged girl must go to a meeting where they're indoctrinated on birth control by Dennis Streeter and other perverted things that he teaches them. And so, is that definition, this new definition that's cropping up in our dictionaries, is it a valid definition? Well, let's go to the Bible. We must go to the Bible to find out what conception is. Here's where we'll get our answer, Hebrews 11, 11. Now, let's get off the handy-dandy NIV that's in the pulpit, and let's see if the NIV can help us. It can't, but we're going to get it out anyway. Look at Hebrews 11, 11. Uh, great verse in the Bible. Hebrews 11, 11. I'm going to turn there in the, in the non-inspired version. Now, the King James Bible has the answer. Thank God. Through faith also, Sarah herself Receive strength to conceive seed. Now think about this. Sarah conceived what? <laughs> seed. Guess where the seed comes from? The man. Guess when the seed is there? At conception. Did you know that it's not there seven days later in the implantation? <clears throat> so when God talks about conception, what's he talking about? An egg and a seed. Because guess what? The seed is only there the day of fertilization, or maybe the next day. Seven days later, when implantation takes place, that seed is long gone. So if conception is when it implants in the wall of the uterus, then you can't conceive seed. 
because the siege has been gone for days. You see what I'm saying? How the Bible has all the answers. Let's see what the NIV has for us. Listen to this. Look down at your Bible. I'm going to read you the NIV. By faith, Abraham. Now, that's a big difference right there. We're not even talking about the same person. By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age, dash. This, and this is really easy to understand. There's a hyphen. And Sarah herself was barren, hyphen, was enabled to become a father because he considered him faithful for the promise. Now, is that the same thing? In the Bible, it says Sarah was the one that had the faith. <coughs> Sarah had faith and received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful to the promise. So, the NIV just takes this liberty to just quote And it doesn't say that in Greek. There's no Greek manuscript anywhere. They just decide to just change it. Make it a little easier to understand. Uh, by bringing Abraham into the whole thing. It's not even about Abraham. It's about Sarah. She's the one who had the faith. It already talked about Abraham's faith. Other examples. This is an example of Sarah's faith. She didn't have any faith, apparently. It was all Abraham's faith. According to the NIV. So, we see here that... Did you notice I took out any reference to conceiving seed? So now, according to the NIV, it's like we don't even know what conception is anymore. King James tells us what conception is. It's a seed. And an egg. That's what conception is, period. It's a woman, Sarah, and a seed from Abraham. Conception. So life begins at conception, according to the Bible, unequivocally. There's no doubt about it. Unless you just want to walk out and just lie to yourself. It begins at conception. It begins at fertilization. And so, if it begins at fertilization, look at Exodus, chapter number... Find my place here. Look at Exodus chapter number. Where's that? Where's that? I'm missing a page. Is it in my NIV? <laughs> Exodus 21. There we go. Found it. Sorry. Exodus chapter 21. We're going to go into some more uh, evil things. So far, we talked about what the IUD is it evil. Oh yeah, it's a device that's killing babies that are seven days old in their mother's womb. It's evil, it's wicked. Uh, it's, it's murder. But let's, let's, let's look at it, Exodus 21, verse 22. The Bible says, If men strive and hurt a woman with child, so that her fruit depart from her. So Brother Dave, stand up. Uh, let's say Brother Dave and I are striving, okay, and my wife's pregnant. Right? Come on, come on over here. <laughs> So we're wrestling around. Like, oh! All of a sudden, he throws me, and I go flying into my wife. And just slam into her. And what happens? She goes into labor. And, and the baby dies, and has a miscarriage, because I was flung into her by Brother Dave. Because we were striving with one another. We were wrestling with each other. And we're in a brawl and in a fight. One of us goes flying into her. Causes her fruit to depart from her. Causes her child to die in the womb. Are you following the story? It says, He shall be surely punished if he does this thing. Okay, According as the woman's husband will lay upon him. And he shall pay. So there's a financial penalty involved as the judges determine. And look at this. And if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life. So he said, if it was intentional, okay, I mean, if, if I intentionally set out to beat her up or you know if, if, if I go up to her and just beat her up because I'm drunk or whatever and cause her fruit to depart from her and I intentionally did that or, or th then the Bible calls me a murderer because it says that it's going to go life for life I mean I should receive the death penalty now if it's an accident if we're just struggling and fighting we didn't know she was there it's an accident it's called manslaughter according to the Bible and there's a penalty I mean it's a crime he says a financial penalty but it's not murder because it was an accident now, are there people who use IUDs by accident and they don't know that they're murdered? There are. There are some people who are ignorant. Now, it's their fault that they're ignorant, right? But there are women that are ignorant. And they're using them because the doctor, uh, some doctor in a Bible, I mean, think about it. Some girl, some 18-year-old girl, she doesn't know what's going on, maybe, or 1920. She's at Hiles Anderson or one of these other Bible colleges. She walks in and some godly Christian doctor. Oh, Dr. Streeter. Oh, it's so wonderful. He comes in and lies to him and tells him that, and he told him not to use IEDs, but he told him to use birth control pills. 
because it doesn't start until the plantation, which birth control pills do the same thing as an IUD, and I'm going to illustrate that in a moment. Some guy lies to him and tells them either IUDs are okay, or birth control pills are okay, or mini pills are okay, or Depo-Provera shots are okay. Look, they ignorantly, they're not trying to kill their child, some 21-year-old girl in the Bible college, right? I mean, she's just doing what she was taught, okay? So is it really murder if you accidentally kill someone? No. If you accidentally kill someone, it's not murder. But what is it? It's manslaughter, according to the Bible. The Bible used the word manslayer. Who knows the word manslaughter? Put up your hand. <coughs> manslaughter is when I do something wrong and someone dies as a result by accident. Okay? Let's say I'm driving down the road at 125 miles an hour and I run into somebody who's crossing the street. Should I have been going down that busy street at 125 miles an hour? No. And so I killed it. Was I setting out to kill somebody? No. Was it an accident? Yes. What crime have I committed? Murder? No. Manslaughter. Everybody understand that? Uh, there was a, some guys that my dad knew when he was a teenager. A couple of guys, they were brothers, they were out there fist fighting on the lawn. They got upset at each other, and they were uh, beating each other up on the lawn. A cop came and tried to separate them. One of the two brothers swung his fist and punched the cop in the stomach. And the cop died from being punched in the stomach. Because it went about Did you know that's how Houdini died? Who knows who Houdini is? Very Houdini, right? The, the man who was an escape artist. He was a, a really famous uh, magician of the, of the early part of the 20th century. He would uh, escape out of anything. They would tie him up and chain him up and put him upside down in a tank of water and he'd get out of it somehow. Well, Houdini was backstage one time and a guy walked up to him and he was writing something down and he was busy and he wasn't paying attention. The guy walked up to him and said, hey, is it really true that somebody can punch you in the stomach as hard as they can and it won't hurt you? And he said, yeah, that is true. And the guy grabbed him and punched him in the stomach as hard as he could. Now, usually Houdini would do this thing where he would let people punch him in the stomach, but you know, he's flexing his stomach muscles and he's ready for it. Okay. Well, this guy just caught him unawares. Houdini didn't really notice that this guy was really talking to him. He's kind of distracted. He's doing something. The guy punched him in the stomach off guard, and he died a few hours later because it ruptured one of his internal organs because the guy punched him. <coughs> and so it was an accident. He wasn't trying to kill Houdini. Those two guys that my dad knew that were struggling and accidentally killed a police officer, they committed manslaughter. But I'm going to tell you something. If a woman knows the truth about this, <coughs> and still uses an IUD, or still uses birth control, it's not manslaughter, it's murder. Did you hear me? It's murder. To intention, a woman who goes and has an abortion done, it's murder. A woman who puts an IUD in herself, it's murder. A woman who takes birth control pills, it's murder. You, can, you, you don't like that? It doesn't matter. I mean, it's the truth. I don't like it either, but it's true. A woman who knowingly does this after she knows her. Now, women who didn't know about this, maybe before this sermon or before another sermon or before they read on this, uh, it's murder. After they know about it. Before they knew about it, it's what? Manslaughter. Now look, when I first got married, my wife was on birth control pills for the first three months of our marriage. Because I, had a, I just got a new job. The benefits didn't kick in for 90 days. I didn't know what to do. I was young. I didn't know about these things. I thought to myself, I gotta wait for the health insurance because you know, I'm, what am I gonna do? You know, without the health, you know, I thought that health insurance was just everything back then. You know, I thought that's just what you did. I mean, I'd never heard of anybody uh, doing anything other than going to the hospital and giving birth, and you gotta have, and it's thousands of dollars, it's twenty thousand dollars, and if you get pregnant before the health insurance kicks in, it's a pre-existing condition. They're not gonna cover it. You're gonna be paying for it for the rest of your life. Blah blah. That's what people told me, and so I told my wife. I said, you know, we gotta do something here. You know, because in my ignorance, and I was wrong to do that. I should have just had faith in God and done what was right. But I didn't. I committed sin. Lack of faith. And I listened to man <laughs> and uh, put my wife on the birth control pill for three months. After the three months was over, my health insurance kicked in. I said, okay, get off the birth control pills. Now we can have a child. What happened? My wife got pregnant the first month. She was out, off the birth control pill. And guess what happened? She had a miscarriage. Baby died at about three weeks old. Well, the baby died. We were crushed. We were very sad, depressed. You know, it was, it was very hard. And anybody who's lost a child to miscarriage, even early on, it's still a very emotional thing. Especially since it was our first, and we're wondering, is, is she unable to have kids? What's the problem? What's going on? Well, that event prompted us to do research on the subject. And we began to research how birth control pills work. And this is how they work. 
pill that she was taking was known as the combination pill. It's a combination of two hormones. One of them is estrogen, and the other one is progesterone. Okay? These two hormones do two different things. They have two mechanisms. Number one mechanism, they stop a woman from producing eggs. Now, is that murder? No. She never produced the egg, the child was never created. But they have a backup mechanism. The backup mechanism is to, just like an IUD, destroy the line of the uterus, make it a hostile environment, is what the package, we read the package insert, the one that's like this big and it's fine print, it's folded up real small and you open it up and read it. It says in the package insert that it creates a hostile environment in the lining of the uterus. A hostile environment, so that the baby uh, will not be able to implant and it will die. Well, what we realized was that because my wife had been taking birth control pills for three months, when she got off the birth control pills, her uterus was still a semi-hostile environment. And that's why doctors will tell you that if you've been on the pill, you should wait several months before getting pregnant. Because this will happen. Because you've turned your body into a killing machine. And so now, all of a sudden, at the drop of the hat, you can't say, oh, I want to have a child now. The baby might be able to partially implant or implant, but because the environment is wrong, that baby has a very high chance of dying. So, was that miscarriage our fault? Yes. Because she took the pills I told her to take. That was our fault. Was it murder? No. Because we didn't know. Was it manslaughter? Yes. Was it a sin? Yes. Now you say, oh, does that bother you? You feel guilty about that? I don't feel guilty about it at all. You know why? Because I'm saved. Because all I did was confess it as a sin to God, and the Bible says He's forgiven us our sins and separated us as far as the east is from the west. I, you know, I was, I was mournful at the time. I got on my knees and, and told God that I was sorry, and I, I didn't take it lightly. I mean, I, I mourned over it and told God that I had done wrong. I was wicked, and I'm sorry. But then, you know, once I confessed it to God... I moved on. I don't feel guilty about it. Oh, I never even think about it. And that's the way it ought to be with sin in your life, by the way. Yeah. The only time you're going to have guilt in your life is when you don't admit that you're wrong. Once you admit you're wrong, you just confess it to God and just move on. Be done with it. That's what the Bible teaches us. And so, look, this is something that I unknowingly participated in. Because I live in this wicked generation. I was influenced by it. But thank God I've separated myself from it. Thank God I'm not going to continue making the mistake that I once made. And so, uh, I would never ever have anything to do with uh, these birth control pills and IEDs and wicked things ever again. You see, and you say, well, wait a minute, how often is a woman really releasing an egg? Well, with the combination pill, here's the statistics, and I studied many different statistics, and my wife and I did translate it for a while. Uh, we do it on the side a lot, and uh, one time we did it just as our only source of income for four months straight. We spent more than 40 hours a week doing nothing but translating medical articles from German into English. She would translate some, and I would proofread hers, and then I would translate some, and she would proofread mine, and we would work on these kind of as a team a little bit. And uh, we worked on these articles, and, and some of them were about birth control pills, and some of them were about these issues, so we learned a lot. And it was all cutting-edge research that we were translating for pharmaceutical companies to make decisions based on this research. Well. The statistics are like this. When it comes to the combination pill, which is the progesterone-estrogen combination, <coughs> ovulation is suppressed 40% of the time to, in some cases, could be 95% of the time. Okay, are you listening? So the combination pill, a woman is going to basically conceive 5 to 60% of the time. Now there's that big range because all women are different. Situations are different, their bodies are different. But 5 to 60 percent of the time, she's releasing an egg. Okay? And if that egg becomes fertilized, it will die. Because let me tell you something birth control pills, if taken properly, are 99.99 percent effective. Did you hear that? 99.99. You hear about women on birth control pills accidentally getting pregnant? It's because they weren't taking them. It's because they missed a day here and there. If you take birth control pills consistently and don't miss a day and take them like clockwork, they are 99.99% effective. That's what the package insert says. Yet you're ovulating 5 to 60% of the time. Do the math. Are you listening? <laughs> so 5 to 60% of the time, the egg's released, and if it's fertilized, it's going to die. So I would very safely say, 
you could very conservatively say, using the most conservative numbers in math, that a woman who is on the combination pill for two years, which is what independent fundamental Baptists all over America are recommending that people wait two years to have their first child. That's kind of the, ah, two years, two years, ah, wait two years, wait two years, ah, that they say all over America, that you will statistically have at least one silent abortion in that two years if you're on even the most conservative, which is the combination pill. We're using the most conservative numbers. If you've been on it for two years, you had a baby die in your womb and didn't even know about it. Just to do the math. But then there are other pills that are even more common. The mini pill. The progesterone only pill. The, the patch. The progesterone patch. These methods do not suppress ovulation almost at all. Some women, they can suppress ovulation maybe in half the time, half the cases. But in, in, in many women, they don't suppress ovulation at all. And so a woman who's on the patch or on the progesterone only mini pill could be having a silent abortion every single month. Did you hear that? She could be having one every month. And statistically, she's having several per year. Babies that she's killing by taking pills <coughs> that's turning her uterus into a killing machine. Not a not a, a part of a part of her body that's created to produce life into this world has been converted by drugs into a killing machine by the uh, pharmaceutical and medical industry in this country. This is the truth. Christians all over America, God's people, born again, saved, Baptist, fundamental Baptist, conservative Christians all over America. If we were to take a poll, and you know this is right, and if you've grown up in church, if you've been around church, you know that in the average independent Baptist church, or Southern Baptist church, or North American Baptist church, or General Association of Regular Baptist churches, any of these Baptist churches, you know that 80% of the women in the church are taking birth control pills or have taken birth control pills. I mean, it's just true. They're all taking them. And let me tell you something. According, let, let me read you some quotes here. This is a big deal. Listen to this. Listen to this quote. This is from a 1994 study of abortion deaths in Kentucky by the medical industry, uh, people within the medical industry, that is. With over 17 million American women using the pill and other chemical abortifacients, it is estimated that breakthrough ovulation and pregnancy occur so often, are you listening, that between 7 to 12 million newly conceived children are killed by chemical abortions in the womb each year, and most of these women never even knew they were pregnant. So in 1994, 17 million American women were on the pill, and it says that between 7 to 12 million silent abortions were occurring each year. Now, help me out with the math here, and, and uh, it, I believe that there are three to four abortions, three to four thousand abortions per day in the United States. Obviously, it's an average. Three to four thousand abortions take place in the United States. I'm talking about uh, surgical abortions down at Planned Parenthood, okay, where they go in and kill the baby by one means or another. Three to four thousand a day. Let's do a little math, shall we? What is three to four thousand times three hundred and sixty five? <laughs> this is the daily double, so I'm making a little time. No. So it's roughly 1.2 million. Okay. You know, it just depends on whether you're dealing with three or four thousand. Over a million. That's why, have you ever heard this statistic that there have been over 41 million since Roe versus Wade in 1973? You know. Or whatever it is. It's like somewhere in the neighborhood of a million, 1.2 million. How many from birth control pills? It says here that the estimate is between 7 to 12 million per year. So how many are from abortion? How many babies are killed through abortion? 1.2 million. It's wicked. It's horrible. It's awful. How many die through the use of birth control pills? 7 to 12 million. And, and how many of that is by Christians, so-called? Or even real Christians? Or even born-again Christians? Think about this. Now think about God's up in heaven, right? And he sees all the Jerry Falwells of this world and all the Christian activists. And abortion! And abortion! And abortion! 
and their wife's popping birth control pills and killing their own children. His wife's using an IED. Or I'm not saying him personally, I don't know. But what I'm saying is, just all the Christians across America that are screaming and crying out about abortion, do you think God's listening when they're promoting birth control pills, which are doing the same thing, and when they're using IUDs that are doing the same thing? Are you listening to me? God's not listening. It's hypocrisy. It's wrong. Let's see here. 3,000 died in the Twin Towers. About 4,200 soldiers have died in Iraq since the beginning of the war on terror. Uh, we've had uh, 11 astronauts died, or 9 or whatever it was, in the last space shuttle that blew up. But 12 to 17 million have died, but you don't really have the faith to believe that it was really alive because you don't believe the Bible with it. You understand what I'm saying? So what do you think is making God the most upset? And yet, you won't hear this sermon in the Independent Bundle Baptist Churches all over America. I never heard this sermon. I had learned the hard way after I'd already committed the sin. Are you listening? You at least thank God you don't have to be ignorant. Thank God you're hearing about it now. I didn't hear about it. I had to figure it out by becoming a medical translator and reading a bunch of inserts to figure it out. I had to do a bunch of research. My wife had to do a bunch of research to figure it out. Hey, I'm telling you right now, here's another one. Birth Control, this is a book from 2005, Birth Control Pills Cause Early Abortions by J.T. Finn. In America, chemical abortions are estimated to kill more than 7 million babies each year, while surgical abortions kill about 1.5 million babies each year. Uh, this is from an MD, Dr. Baggett, OBGYN, fellow of the American College of Genetics. Scientific papers suggest that escape ovulation occurs 4 to 15% of all cycles of patients taking birth control pills. Thus, as this booklet points out, early chemical abortions are a real and significant concern. The term birth control pills is very accurate because they don't prevent conception, they just prevent birth. Think about that. Birth control pill. They don't stop a woman from getting pregnant, they stop her from giving birth because it kills the baby in the first few weeks. It's no different than... Who thinks the morning after pill? That's okay, right? The morning after pill. It's no different. The morning after pill is the same hormones in a higher dose. It's just a one-shot dose of what other women are taking all month long in small increments. And so, the bottom line is, and I have to end the sermon for sake of time, the bottom line is this. There are people in this world who invent evil things. They invent wicked things. They, uh, there are people in this world who go out and, a whole, and, and they go whoring using inventions of man. Whether it be uh, barrier methods, inventions, such as uh, were smuggled into this country by Margaret Sanger. Whether they're using uh, evil inventions, like the inventors of evil things, like IUDs, like progesterone pills, the packs, the shot, the pill, these drugs that turn your body into a hostile environment. Whatever they're using, there are wicked people in this world that are using wicked means to murder their own sons and daughters, to shed the blood of their own sons and daughters, and God's people, who are being mingled and mixed with the heathen, have learned their works, worshipped their gods, and are doing the same exact thing in God's house that the world once said was illegal. The world once said was wicked and ungodly. That the President of the United States condemned using any kind of birth control. And yet Baptists today are using the most heinous, murderous form of birth control birth control pill. And he said, oh, well, I talked to this Christian doctor and he said that there's this kind of pill that, that doesn't ever kill a child. Shut up, you liar. Sick and tired of people blowing out their mouth saying that they talked to some Christian doctor. Some Christian doctor said it's okay. Blah, 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 blah. You do the research and you'll find out there is no such thing as a pill that stops ovulation altogether. It doesn't exist, and that Christian doctor who's saying that is a liar. And he is a murderer, and I, he's probably not even a crazy, he's probably a wolf in sheep's clothing like a Judas Iscariot. Don't come to me telling me about some Christian doctor. And you know what? You can trust your little Christian doctor to pump you full of drugs. Hey, I'm not, I'm not even going to try to wonder what goes on in the womb. I'm not going to put drugs in, into my wife's body that are going to somehow prevent her from having children. You know, everybody's looking to just have their cake and eat it too. They want to be married. They want to have their little family. They want to have their little fun. They want to just go out and have all the fun. And they don't want to be burdened with kids. Because they want to have their perfect little life. Look, it's wrong. 
and there is no pill on the earth. I've done the research. I've read hours and hours and hours of medical research. These Dr. Streeter and his, and his pervert brother, they're both a couple of perverts in Hammond, Indiana. They're lying to people. Saying, and Bob Hooker and his wife over in Hammond, Indiana, telling people, oh, we did some research, and, and the, the pills that they give out at Hal's Anderson aren't important. They're lying. You can walk away and say that I'm wrong, but you know what? Go do the research then, if you don't believe me. But if you walk out of here and say, well, I'm just going to trust my Christian doctor, you're going to trust him and you're a murderer if you trust him, because I warned you about it right now. And any, hey girls, are you listening to me? Young girls, teenage girls, you listen to me. You heard this sermon tonight, you, you pop a birth control pill and you go out and, and, uh, and sleep with your husband after popping a birth control pill, you are a murderer. And don't, you're never going to be able to say that you didn't know it because you heard it right here tonight. You listen to me? You go ahead and hide behind your Christian doctor, but God knows your heart. And he knows that you heard the truth tonight. And you can look it up. And you know what? Don't trust me then. Go out to the library. Go to the public library. Get the books of the library like we did. That's where we learned all this stuff. We read it in science books. We read the package insert. Because guess what? The package insert has to warn you by law that you're killing your children. And that's why the package insert describes the fact that you kill your children with birth control pills. So consider yourself warned. And consider yourself not ignorant. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for uh, giving me the opportunity.